Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Trigonometry 101 Online. April Fools! Welcome to the lighting workshop of Behind the Curtain. My name is Laura Zableet, and I work in the Arts Engagement Department of the Old Globe Theater in San Diego. And all year round, we have citywide arts programs to share creative experiences and opportunities with our many San Diego communities. And now, since the theater building is closed and we're all trying to stay physically isolated, we're still working to stay artistically and community connected. So Behind the Curtain is a program that usually takes place with our community partners all around San Diego, but right now, for the first time ever, Behind the Curtain is a theater production workshop series that is live streamed once a week here on Facebook. And this is our pilot episode. So thank you for being here as we embark on new arts engagement territory together. So today, we're gonna talk about lighting. What is lighting? If you were the lighting designer for a professional theater production, what would that mean? What would you be doing? And how does somebody become a professional lighting designer? What are, what are some of the skills that they would need? And how can you, right now, practice those same skills in your home today? And then, how might some of those skills carry into other parts of your life? We're gonna be exploring some of these questions today, along with trying out some lighting activities that you can do right now with whatever you have around you. We'll also have some time to answer any questions that you have for our guest artist today. So drop any questions that you have in the comment section before the end. What you'll need for today's workshop is pretty easy stuff. Uh, if you have a, a piece or two of scratch paper, go ahead and grab that. Uh, a flashlight would be really helpful, but the one that's on your phone will work just fine. Uh, uh, being close to a housemate or a mirror or a pet could be helpful so that you can experiment with how lighting looks on faces. And it might also be helpful to sit in a bit of a darker room so that you can have more control when you're playing with lighting. Got it? Okay, let's get started. Today, I am honored to welcome our lighting designer guest artist, Heather Reynolds, to the live stream. Welcome, Heather! Woo! Hi, so, thank you. <laughs> Heather has a pretty impressive, uh, a pretty impressive sheet here. So let me share with you all the different places that Heather has learned and worked. Heather is the assistant lighting director here at the Old Globe, and she has been working professionally since 2011. She attended Florida State University and has worked at the Williamstown Theater Festival, the Maine State Music Theater, the Utah Shakespeare Festival, and more. Before working at the Old Globe, she was the lighting and audio supervisor, as well as the associate production manager at Southern Utah University, while also working freelance as a lighting designer, assistant designer, and draftswoman. So today she's gonna lead us through what it means to create lighting in the theater. Hello, Heather, saying thank you so much and welcome again. Hi, thank you, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, and you've taught behind the curtain in person in our with community partners before, right? Yes, I've actually had the opportunity to teach it twice, so I'm really excited to be doing it again. Thank you for being with us on this inaugural online Hello. journey. Uh, I'm Honored to be the pilot episode. Oh yeah, oh yeah, this is great. Uh, <laughs> so I'd love to start this in the same way that we would start it if we were in an in-person workshop. So even though there's only two of us right now instead of a whole room full of people, I would love to start with a check-in. And a check-in kind of helps us get a sense of uh, where I myself am at, where you are at, and uh, at the beginning of any artistic process, we kind of like to, to, to bring that into the space. So today, the check-in that I would love to share is something that I'm, I'm sharing with you now from Project Aware, which is one of our incredible community partners led by Reginald Washington. And the way that folks at Project Aware begin their check-ins is by sharing a name, your name, and then only one word to describe how you're feeling right now. Not in general, just in this moment. What are you feeling right now? Which sounds simple, right, Heather? <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. But there's a catch. So Ah, there's, there's always a catch. Always a catch. <laughs> so there are some words that we want to avoid. So responding with words like good, all right, fine, and okay, those tend to be masking words that are, mm. are trying to mask instead of share how we're really feeling. And uh, we are, we're also going to try to avoid physical words such as hungry or tired that are more describing a physical state instead of 
you know, the feels feeling. So does that sound all right with you, Heather? That sounds amazing. Okay. You want to go first? Name and a word to describe how you're feeling today? Sure. I am Heather, and I'm feeling energized. Nice. I am Laura, and I am feeling jumpy. And that is the honest no. truth. <laughs> and if anybody's <laughs> watching at home, I would love it if you participate any time that Heather and I are discussing. In this way, put the word that describes how you are feeling down in the comments. And thank you so much to Reginald Washington and the whole Project Aware community for sharing that with us. And we are now able to share with you. So, Heather, we have a lot yes. of things that we want to talk about today. Yes, we do. We do. But first, would you please define lighting for us? Very simply, what is lighting for theater? Sure. So uh, lighting for theater is basically, with one exception, there's production, projection design as well, which also deals mm -hmm. with putting light on stage. But for the most part, we, deal, we are going to deal with anything that puts light on stage. Things like determining angle, color, uh, anything like that. All of that is going to be under the purview of the lighting designer. Mm. That kind of sounds like words that people use to describe paintings. Angle yeah, that's true. Or... We deal it, the the compositional way that painting works is very similar to how a lighting designer is going to work. That's awesome. So th that's also yeah. a lot of freedom in that. Uh, yes. With all those different elements, right? Definitely. So so you you have some photos to kind of help us understand in a tangible sense what that can mean, right? I do. So we're going to look at some photos that show us some different angles of light. Mm -hmm. uh, and that gives us a start into how to understand kind of visually where a lighting designer goes. So if we look at the first photo, we can see our model. Um, this is going to be uh, my dog, Diana. We did a little uh, rock, paper, scissors to see which of us would be the model. And I won because <laughs> I have opposable thumbs. Um, so first, this is just a photo of her so that we kind of know what she looks like because that'll help inform us as we look mm -hmm. at the, the different angles. Yeah. Um, so we're going to look at our next photo. She's pretty cute. She is pretty cute. I'm a pretty big fan of her. Ooh, that um, almost looks like a different dog. Yeah, exactly. So this is going to be Diana lit entirely by front light. So front light's going to be anything that's kind of coming this way at you. Mm -hmm. And it does a couple things. So the first thing you're going to notice is we see her features really well. Like we can really clearly see her face, yeah. um, any facial expression. But what we're losing is any texture. We're really losing jawline, any shadows kind of under the eyes, anything like that is getting lost mm. because the light is coming straight on and it kind of flattens the features, mm. which is really great if we want to be able to see someone's facial expression or understand what it is that they're saying. But it's not so great in terms of kind of helping us get a little more dimension in the body or the object that we're lighting. Mm -hmm. um, so that's front light. We're going to look at our next photo, which is going to be very different. Uh, Ooh, yeah. And this is going to be side light. So as you can see, it looks very, very different. So dramatic, light almost, coming right? straight from just here. Yeah, and it's very dramatic. So totally different from that front light we were looking at before. Yeah. And what this ends up doing is you can see we lose this entire half of her face. Mm -hmm. um, but while we lose part of the face, what we're gaining is you start to see the shadows under the eyes. We get a lot more dimensionality mm -hmm. in the body. So we can kind of see those outlines of a body which is why side light in particular is really popular if you've ever seen dance um, mm. because dance is so about understanding the body and the movement of the body that side light really helps yeah. highlight yeah. that so there's that silhouette uh, on one side while still being lit huh exactly so we get a little bit more of just one side we can still see facial features but not as much um, but it feels very different from yeah. front light so if yeah. we look at the next photo we're going to see another different way to look at lighting. Oh, she looks so sweet and cute in this one. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot, this one in particular, there was a lot of treats involved in getting her to sit, to sit still. <laughs> um, but this is gonna be backlight. So this is a light from right behind the head. You notice we get this really cool haloing technique. Yeah. Um, but we really lose the features, which is interesting, right? Mm. So mm. as opposed to front light where I get all of your facial features and totally understand what it is that you might be saying to me or know what your facial expression is really clearly in backlight by losing all of that, I can make a really interesting choice because yeah. someone coming up to you and saying, hey, how's it going? Can feel really different if I can totally see them and see what they're saying versus if someone where I, all I can see is kind of this outlined halo of their face, someone coming up and saying it that way might feel a little different. Yeah. And that's a choice that a lighting designer can make just by choosing what angle of light to light you with. Mm, yeah. um, 
And also what we were talking about before with front light, where if I flatten you out, you're kind of become indistinguishable. Mm -hmm. Giving someone a kind of halo effect around them can help kind of pull them out of any kind of background that's there. So that's just another mm. interesting way that we can use this. So we're gonna look at one more picture of oh. Diana. So this is kind of a combination, right? Because yeah. in this time we're using one light to kind of represent all of these different angles of light. We can also combine them. So this is kind of a, a diagonal backlight. So this would be like a light shining right here and coming in this way. Yeah. And what that does is we get kind of that same haloing effect. We also start to get a little bit of that side light effect around the face and the shoulder. So we start creating some, again, some interesting shadows. I can see some more of her face. Yeah. Um, all of those things start to get pulled out in a really interesting way. Yeah, that's so interesting because that one's so similar to two of the other ones. Right. But even that one, one little angular change with the same uh, single source of light makes such a difference in the telling. It makes of the a story really big difference. Diana. It looks really, it looks really different. So yeah, yeah, we've looked at a lot of different ways that Diana, just sitting on the couch, can look really different. Yeah. And it's really easy to experiment with this at home, which is really cool. I did this with just a desk lamp and a camera, and I mean a lot of dog treats. Uh, but made it really easy to kind of experiment with all these different ways of looking at angles of light, which is one of the big tools that a lighting designer has when telling a story. Yeah. Can I, can I try? Absolutely. Okay. So, so uh, what, what should I get around me? What do I need? You should have a light source that can be the cam, the flashlight on your phone. That can be a flashlight. That can be a desk lamp, like what I used. Um, basically anything that will give you a source of light that you have the ability to move around. Okay. Great. Right. Great. I guess I should turn so off the light then, huh? So turn off the lights is a great place to start. Great. I'm on it. <laughs> and here we go. So now what do I do? All right. So to exper you could experiment with this all you want. Just play with the angles. See something a lot of people have probably done with this already. And if you've ever told scary stories and you hold the flashlight under your chin, exactly. Like it helps make it feel a little scarier. Um, but to experiment with this a little bit, I'm going to give you a couple of emotion words that describe emotions. Okay. And I want you to use your flashlight um, and your face uh, or whatever you like to see if you can describe that emotion just using the light. Okay. Does that sound like fun? Cool. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So joy. Joy. Okay. Uh, joy. Man, with this one source of light and in the dark, it, it feels so dramatic mm -hmm. that... I don't associate so much drama with joy, but I suppose, you know? Oh, that, this is yeah, kind of cute, right? Yeah, that's interesting. It makes like me making think of a, like a, a, a firefly or a fairy, which is, which is joyful. It's not, it's not yeah. scary and dramatic. It's just cute and joyful. Maybe. Yeah. And I think it's, it's cool that you can make a, a choice about a light being like a physical, tangible thing and not just a source of light, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So that's cool. I like I like your joy. Thank so I got I got another one. You ready? Yeah, ready. Fear. Fear. Am, am I am I scary or am I scared? I don't know. That's for you to decide. I would like to be scary. <laughs> All right. Well, be scary then. So let's, this. Mm, let's try. Oh, right. Oh, where you can't. See oh, that's my interesting, eyes. right? Like, I can definitely tell you're a person, but I'm starting to lose your eyes, any definition to your mouth. Mm. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. There's a, yeah. I couldn't tell what emotion I had if I had any, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, now I'm smiling, so you can kind of see. But <laughs> okay. Great. Final answer. Yeah? Feel good? Final answer? Final answer. What's next? All right. Pride. Pride. Uh, pride. 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 See, it's, it's, it's my, my instinct is to use my face <laughs> and make a, pr a proud face or a happy face. And I'm trying to keep my face quiet for a minute so that it's really about the camera angle or the lighting angle. But um, well, that's pride. interesting, right? So like lighting can interact with what the actor or the playwright is doing to help kind of reinforce the story they're telling mm. by facial expressions. Or in some cases, they might want to act against it um, right. to tell a different story. So you're that's. Mm. Sometimes the actor's going to give you one thing and you're trying to do another, and sometimes you want to help reinforce that. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because I guess when I, when I go down here, I could, give the, I could give the happiest, kindest, smiley face I could possibly muster, and it's not going to look happy. It's going to still look creepy, right? Yeah, no, you look like a horror movie poster <laughs> a little bit. 
I bet people who are logging onto the live stream right now are just <laughs> turning it right back. <laughs> They're like, I'm, I'm out of here. I didn't turn it, tune in I'm to watch done. it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but Pride, I think, I think in that case for Pride, I, uh, okay, if I, if I'll, I'll incorporate a little bit of uh, face in it, but I'll tilt my face up in the way that if there's some light um, basking in it, and if there's if yeah. someone, maybe if I'm proud, I am, I'm reveling in, in the light. Is yeah, that that's fair? great. Okay. Yeah, I like that. All right. Pride so now, now anger. 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 Maybe, maybe scary story. Yeah. Cause there's, yeah, that's good. I'm not trying, I'm trying really hard to keep my face quiet, but even with it <laughs> as quiet as I can get it, my eyes look mad. Right. No, it's true. Me? Yeah. Right. Cause well, no, cause it affects your, the way you're lit affects your perception of the situation. It's yeah. one of those tools of lighting design that we have. Hmm. Okay. Anger. There we go. All right. Now the last one, mm -hmm. compassion. What is it? Compassion. Compassion. Huh. Um, compassion. Uh, I'm trying to think of some silhouetting stuff or, you know, when I, when I do half of my face, it, it feels, it feel it reminds me of those the cover of magazines where where prominent mm. leaders and figures are lit intentionally half in the dark it seems mm -hmm. and maybe maybe that's done in order to encourage people to view them as human and, mm, interesting. and when i think about viewing people with humanity i think about compassion so let me let me try to put myself on the cover of time magazine <laughs> <laughs> yeah no There's that's compassion. great Great. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. That was so fun. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn the light. Yeah, back absolutely. On now. That's good. Don't fall over. That would be bad. I will not. I will not fall over. <laughs> I'm, uh, uh, I'm grateful for you leading me through that. And if anybody comes up with anything cool at home for any of those prompts, take a picture, share it with us. That'd be really cool to see how many different Definitely. things people could come up with for the same, uh, for the same prompt using only a single source of light and angles. Which I never really thought about before. Absolutely. And it'd be really interesting if you try to do it not using a face, because in a lot of ways, like we talked about, a face can give you kind of a shorthand for yeah. understanding something. But like if you use a different object, does it make you feel a different way? I don't know. Hmm. You should go try it and find out. Yeah. Cool. That's a fun challenge um, to try with, with a book sometime or a pencil. Can yeah. Can a pencil be compassionate? <laughs> I don't know. I guess you'll find out. I guess we can will. Lighting, in the can comments. lighting tell you, help you understand that? I don't know. I guess you'll find out. We'll find out. We'll learn from our from our viewers. Okay. So what's what's next? So um, what we just did, playing with angles, is a major part of a lighting designer's process. It's kind of one of the first steps in kind of thinking about what you want a show to look like. Mm. Um, mm. And how, you know, where do I put the lights? You know, you have 360 degrees of opportunity, right? To put yeah. lights in different places. Yeah. So once you start thinking about what you want things to look like, thinking about the angles gonna, you're going to use to try to help tell that story is, is a big step in the process. And as you saw, it's a thing that's kind of fun and pretty easy to, to experiment with on your own. Totally, totally. And you already kind of touched on it, but in terms of how lighting interacts with other elements of a theater production, how does it, how does it fit in with a show as a whole, interacting with things like uh, costumes or sets or sound? Uh, tr I think in a lot of ways, lighting designers end up becoming almost the most reactive of the design areas in the mm -hmm. sense that our design is so ephemeral that we're always reacting to what is the set doing on stage? Mm -hmm. You know, what are the costumes on the actors? What are the actors doing on stage? We're Gosh. reacting um, to all of those things. Uh, and we work together, we all work together and we're all very collaborative. But I think as a lighting designer, something that's really interesting is how we kind of get to react to what all the other designers are doing and help influence, or like we talked about, work against sometimes intentionally what it is that they're they're trying to do. Um, and in another sense, with scenic designers, mm -hmm. there's a lot of times, a lot of collaboration about like, if there's a table lamp or a sconce or a chandelier on stage that might've been designed scenically, but the lighting designer is gonna be responsible, lighting designer is gonna be responsible for turning it on and deciding, you know, what kind of light bulb is going to go in it. All of those things oh come gosh. down to the lighting designer. So there's a lot of collaboration there as well. Yeah, yeah. Because if if it's if it's a what if it's something like a flashlight that some an actor or a character is using on stage, or is that 
the lighting uh, something like that would usually be a prop but we might provide the batteries mm -hmm. um, we would probably help decide what kind of light source is going to come out of that flashlight yeah um, so is it a more traditional flashlight are we using a more modern led flashlight mm. uh, for people who have used led flashlights you'll often notice there's different types of colors that come in led flashlights huh. So what kind of LED flashlight are we going to use? Those are all questions that will come back a lot of times to a conversation with the lighting designer yeah. who's going to talk about what kind of light they want to come out of that, even if props is the one building or providing the flashlight. Yeah, so there can be lights on the stage, but also in the whole space, I suppose. Mm -hmm. what, how, does, how does somebody, how does a designer approach that, knowing where, where to put lights, in short? Um, well, that would be part of the design process where you start kind of getting into what you think this show is going to look like. You start making those kind of visual uh, decisions about what it is that you want the show to look like, which will start informing where you should put the lights. Yeah, we, I think we, we have, a, there's a diagram of some sort. What is, what is the official term for, for what, we, what we have to show folks? Uh, sure. So we have a plan view drawing, which we can look at, which um, when you're a lighting designer trying to decide where you should put lights, mm -hmm. um, you would basically, it's like looking at the theater as if I'm a bird flying above and I look straight down and I cut off the top of the theater this way, yeah. and basically took off the roof. Yeah. And now I'm looking straight down at the theater. So this particular one is the Globe Theater. Uh, mm -hmm. just the stage. So we're not looking at the house, which is what we call where the audience sits. We're right. just looking at the area of the stage. Okay. Um, so we'll get drawings from the scenic designer that show where the set is going to go. Uh, and then we will start making decisions about where we're going to put lights. And to do that, we'll use this drawing. And then we also, I also have a second drawing, which is called a section view, which we yeah. can look at. So cool. um, and so if that overhead view is me cutting the theater in half this way. Section view is if I took the theater and cut it right down the middle this way, and then took a step back and started looking at the theater as like a cross section. Um, so, so those, those kind of look steps. Like steps. Those are where the audience is, the gray steps? Yes, that's where the audience would be. The, the seats aren't drawn, but that is where the audience would sit. And then that other big area is gonna be the stage area. Okay. Oh, this is so cool. I never got to see those diagrams before. But, um, but we'll also have those available in the comments section for folks to download and draw on yourself, you the viewer at home, if, if you want to take this to the next yeah. level. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Heather, I know I, I kind of jumped a step. But the main question, what we just saw for this, with these diagrams, mm -hmm. takes place towards the beginning of the process. But what does that process look like? For example, when you, when you get an email or a call that says, you are the lighting designer for this show. What mm -hmm. do you do? What happens next? Great. Uh, so I'm going to describe my process, and I can only speak for myself, and every lighting designer is going to be a little different, but I think the, the basic framework is going to be somewhat similar for everyone. Uh -huh. So for me personally, when I get invited or asked to do a show, where I'll start is kind of where we all start, which is reading the play and seeing, yeah. you know, asking myself some questions about the play. You know, what do I think the story is about? Who do I think this story is about? Um, what do I think is important in the story to tell? And yeah. why this play now? Mm. Um, and I think those are all really interesting artistic questions to ask about any show you're being asked to do yeah. and think about, you know, why are we doing this show? Yeah, that's so interesting to think that even that every person, not just the director, not just the, the producers, that every designer is mm -hmm. thinking about why this show now and, what it, and how is that going to inform or affect my work? Right. Um, so there's that side of kind of reading the play. And then I'll read the play again to look for things um, that are a little more, I don't want to call them technical, but things that are in the script that are going to affect the lighting. So if mm. there's any description in any scenes about like, oh, this is happening at noon, or oh, this is scene is happening in the middle of the night. Well, lighting yeah. wise, as we all know from living in the world, those are two times of day that look very different. Um, yeah. So starting to make note of those as a lighting designer is going to be important. You know, is there a window that they keep talking about, like this character keeps going and looking out the window? Well, that mm. means I need to somehow show that yeah. there's probably light coming in through that window. Um, yeah. So all those things are kind of another pass I'll take at the script. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'll go and start having conversations with the director and with the other designers. Um, and that's going to kind of, you know, I've 
thought about how I feel about the script, but for any given production, it's really important to remember and understand that the director's vision is what really is ultimately going to drive any particular production. Yeah. Um, and certainly my personal view can have influence on the production and on my design, but really thinking about what is the director trying to do with the script? What story are they trying to tell? Yeah. Um, it's kind of the next step in the process. And that's interesting that as if I, if I were a lighting designer, what I saw as important in the story to tell or understood in the story to be important might change depending on what day it is or definitely what year it is and what, what my life experiences are. Yeah, so you might because we all kind of pull from the same stock of plays, you might do the same show in your career five times. But if you do those shows 10 years apart, yeah. how you feel about them is probably very different. Yeah. Which is really interesting to think about as a lighting designer. Yeah. And, and I know that the Old Glow, we hire a lot of amazing, amazing artists of all disciplines who are local because there's a lot of incredible artists in San Diego. And sometimes there are lighting designers who are hired from out of town. So mm -hmm. those designers are starting their process not even having ever seen necessarily the Old Globe Theater space, right? That is true. So that's why those drawings that we looked at before become really important. Because mm. kind of the next step in the process, well, the next step is really to start thinking about like what is the show going to look like and mm -hmm. for me the way I start doing that kind of a tricky part of lighting is that it's it's so ephemeral mm. you know a light only exists physically as long as a physical light is on in the world yeah um, so while a scenic designer might have the benefit of a model or the ability to share paint samples or any of those things a costume designer can show renderings or fabric samples and we as lighting designers can provide renderings as well but it's a little harder you yeah. have to have some way to visually communicate, here's what I think I'm going to try to do. Yeah. So having a knowledge of painting, like you mentioned before, it was interesting that you mentioned that because that's a tool we use a lot. Huh. And a photography to kind of help start having those conversations about visually what you're going to do yeah. is really important to me. That's really neat. Are you a good painter or photographer at all? Uh, I'm a pretty decent photographer. Painting, uh, I can do it, but it's not any great art. So I usually rely on like the masters of the craft to <laughs> um, to help me do what I'm trying to do. Um, That's really awesome. I I I, uh, I wish that I could be in like a museum full of lighting designers' <laughs> vision boards, you know? Because I wonder yeah, how many different forms those would take. Yeah, for sure. Um, um, and then after, so after they, there's these the visual. What would visual you, uh, research. Visual I research. I call it visual research. Okay. Um, so you start, you know, having these conversations. And once you think you've settled on like a direction you're going to go, what you start creating a light plot, mm -hmm. which is where those drawings that we looked at and the fact that you mentioned like a lot of our designers come from out of town become mm -hmm. really important. Mm -hmm. Because basically what a lighting designer is going to do is tell the production team, um, by which I mean the team that works on the productions at that particular theater, where all the lights are going to go in the theater for that show. Okay. Um, so using those drawings, like you mentioned, if you're out of town, you may never have actually stepped in the building before, but based on these drawings, any photos that are provided to you of the space by the team who works at the theater, mm -hmm. you're going to start figuring out where all these lights are going to go. And that's where things like this visual research, thinking about the angle of light that you want is going to be important because mm. that's going to start telling you where those lights are going to go. Because yeah. if you can say to yourself, well, I know I want to have backlight." And that means, oh, the light, I know I need to have a light that is going to be behind the actor in order to get them that light. So those sorts of things start informing you of where all these lights are going to go. And then you start generating drawings that show this kind of light is going to go here. Yeah. It's going to do this. Um, we have something called gel, which is going to be dyed plastic sheets, basically, that you can put in front of a light that will change it, you know, whatever color, blue, green, yeah. purple, whatever. Lighting designer is also responsible for choosing all of the color for the show too. So you're making all of those decisions without sometimes ever even having walked inside the theater wow. um, and before you ever get on site. So you're making cool. all of those choices ahead of time. So then that, that diagram that's all drawn over, it come, arrives to the old globe and lights are hung. And then, mm -hmm. and then is that the moment when the lighting designer does need to be here in person in San Diego? Yeah, so that's when the lighting designer will usually arrive on site mm -hmm. um, and you'll start the first step in the process is generally going to be focus. So all of those lights you've hung everywhere, you now have to point wherever they're going to go. Hmm. Um, 
which to me is kind of one of the most fun parts of the process because it's when like you really start figuring out how all of these pieces and parts are going to start actually coming together Mm. Um, as you sit there and you stand on stage and you might have your electrician you know all the way across the theater with a light and you're like okay tip it up a little bit all right now tip it down so you can have that light focused exactly where you want and that really starts informing like what is the show going to start to look like once I start Mm. turning all these lights on oh that's so interesting when when you're on stage and you're testing out the lights this is a totally random question, but does does the way that the, the lights that you have designed, the way that those lights are feeling for you, does that ever inform your choices because you have a sense of what that experience is under those lights? Um, sometimes, for me at least as a designer, like I'll kind of know what I want a given light to look like Yeah. before I get on stage. And it's also visually it's hard when the light is pointed at you to see what it looks like that's why we Mm. suggested before when you're playing with angles if you're playing by yourself it's helpful to have a mirror so you can kind of see what things look like yeah so i'll know what i what i'm doing and how that will probably translate on stage but a lot of times lighting designers will actually ask their assistant or an electrician who's standing by if they want to look at something Mm. they'll step out of the light and ask them to step into it and then Mm. look at it and might make adjustments that way too okay because ultimately we're designing the show for the audience in that sense to help inform their relationship to the piece rather than Mm. how an actor necessarily feels in the light that makes sense yeah yeah totally yeah and so while you're doing focusing the actors are somewhere in a rehearsal hall and the the costume designer is somewhere else and everybody's kind of separate when is the moment when is what's the next part of the process and how do things start to come together so the next part of the process is going to be called the technical rehearsal process and it's where the whole group kind of starts first coming together so the actors have been rehearsing with the director all the designs have kind of been happening you know there's a set on stage costumes have been completed we've hung and focused all these lights now we're all coming together we're sitting in this room and we're going to take the show that's been rehearsed and we're going to take all the technical elements and we're going to smush them all together Mm -hmm. and make a show now for the lighting designer what that means is it's time to be in the hot seat um because sometimes you'll have some time to start writing uh what we call light cues which are if you think about like i take a photo of a sunset Mm -hmm. and you know that sunset has these really specific colors and it has a really specific way that it feels that's kind of like writing a light cue so I'll write a specific moment which means Mm -hmm. I'll turn on all these lights and figure out what I want a moment of the show to look like and then I'll record it in a whiteboard as which is a control system which we'll talk a little bit more about later um, as a lighting cue so each moment of the show will have a light cue or multiple light cues um, and that's kind of the, the thing of lighting design ultimately is writing all of these cues for these moments in the show. Yeah. But the thing I talked about before, lighting is ephemeral. You kind of have to do it in the room as it's happening. Um, right. It means that during tech is when kind of all of that has to happen. And as the lighting designer, that means you have to make a lot of decisions really fast um, and start being able to build this show kind of as it's happening during yeah. tech, which Artistic is really fun, decisions. but also really challenging. Yeah, those because those are those are decisions that are that are, that shape the art and that come from a, a creative space, but under pressure in in, in a rush, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's it's you in a room, and you have a ton of people who are absolutely there to support you and help you. But ultimately, it's you in a room making a lot of decisions mm. um, that are going to affect the show that you have to make kind of quickly because tech has to keep moving along. Yeah. Um, so it's a challenge in that way, but it's really kind of a fun challenge. And then after tech, are you done? What happens next? Uh, so not always, but a lot of times we do something called previews, which mm-hmm. is where tech is, we're not teching all day like we would have done beforehand, mm-hmm. um, but we'll do, we'll make any changes we want to make. You know, I might decide I want to change a color. Scenery might have some paint touch-ups to do. All of those things will happen in the morning and then we'll do a short rehearsal and then we'll perform for an audience at night. And we'll do that for a couple of days because that really mm-hmm. helps us us tighten up the show and having an audience there will inform a lot about what Mm. you're seeing on stage yeah and then after previews are open then you'll open the show and that's when the lighting designers process is pretty much over for the most part that's 
so interesting. And and if anybody who's watching, if you have any questions about anything that you're hearing so far, don't forget to put those questions in the comment se section so that section so that Heather can answer them at the end of this workshop. Uh, but before before we get to that, uh, Heather, I know that you had something that you wanted to show us today that every professional yes. lighting designer knows really, really well. What is that? That is very true. We're going to look at a light booth and that control console I talked about before. We're going to look at that as okay. well. Um, so I have a photo that we can look at. Oh, cool. Yeah, so this is going to be um, the light booth at a theater. Uh, this is uh, actually what the lighting board programmer is oftentimes looking at. So we have a lighting designer and a lot of times now, not always, but a lot of times, you'll have a light board programmer as well. So that's someone whose entire job is to take that information I talked about before where I'm making a light cue, which means I'm saying, I want this light to be on this bright. I want this light to be this color yeah. and all of that stuff. Well, that's information has to go somewhere. Yeah. And where it goes these days is a lighting control console. Okay. which is, I mean, honestly, a glorified computer. So that particular lighting console is actually running Windows software under the hood that you not really necessarily know it, but it's basically a computer with some fancy buttons. Oh, that's ultimately. so funny. I've never had anybody explain that to me before because when I, when I look at a picture like we're seeing right now, it seems like a, like a piece of equipment that I have no frame of reference for how to use any of that. But just to know that it's just a computer with different buttons that are, that are more specified for what it's doing helps a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so actually, if you are really interested in this um, seminar and you think I absolutely want to go off and learn more about lighting, if you look down in the video description, right? That's yes, where it'll be. It's in the video description. So in the video description, there's going to be some links, and one of them is going to be to ETC, Electronic Theater Controls website, and they're actually the manufacturers of that particular light board. Um, and they also, like I said, that, so that's just a glorified computer basically. If you want to, you can take, go to their website and download that software to play with on your own personal computer. Oh, that's um, so cool. Yeah, so you can start playing with and seeing kind of these tools that a lighting designer and a programmer have to control mm -hmm. all of these lights that we have yeah. now. Oh, that's um, awesome. Yeah, so a light board programmer has become really important as lighting has kind of become more complex. Yeah. Uh, now we have, you know, back in the olden days, um, even when I was learning, it was a lot more just lights, like a light, kind of like a desk lamp in your house, or if you have any of those like lights on a little dimmer where you can make them brighter or dimmer. Yeah, yeah. That was a lot of what we were working with before, but now yeah. we have things like LED lights yeah. that can change color in any given moment. Um, we have moving lights, which we'll talk a little bit about in our next photo. Um, all of those things have to be programmed into the light board. So programming the light board has become a much more complex process as time has gone along, mm -hmm. um, which is why it's so helpful to have someone in the room whose job it is just to take this artistic and somewhat technical information from the lighting designer and turn it into something that can be programmed into the light board. Yeah, that's, that's super, that's really interesting to, to have that frame of reference. Yeah. So thank you for that. And, uh, and I, want, I know that we have already a couple of questions, so I want to make sure that we leave time for them. So, but we do have yes. one more, one more, a couple more things that we wanted to look at real quick and then in another image. Yeah, so we're going to look at another image that's from the globe. Um, this is actually, it's a very similar setup to what we looked at before, but that other setup was in a light booth. Mm -hmm. um, this one is going to be in the house, which I said before is where, what we call where the audience sits in a theater. Yeah. Um, and this is actually, you can see just peeking there in the upper right hand corner, uh, a little bit of the set from Almost Famous because oh, this blue was. House type thing. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Uh, so this was the light board programmers set up during tech, technical rehearsals right. for Almost Famous. Okay. So that they had their own lighting console, tons of monitors. Uh, you can see sitting on that little pad of paper there on the lower left hand corner. Um, their headset, which is what allows them to communicate with a lighting designer who has their own table yeah. on the lower level of the theater. Um, and their job is to, to program all this information into the light board. Uh, one of the reasons they become so important now in lighting is we use LEDs, like I talked about before. Yeah. But if you've ever seen moving lights, which if you've ever been to a concert, if you've ever watched something like The Masked Singer on TV, for example, yeah. um, we'll have lights that do kind of what they say they can, which is move. Uh, those lights we talked about before during focus where you have to have a person there to tip them up, tip them down, mm -hmm. point them where you want them to go. A moving light 
is basically a, a light on a motor that is able to move around to change size of the beam of light coming out of it. A lot of them can change color um, and image and all sorts of things. Whoa, that sounds like a any lot given moment. of gear. There's a lot of technical equipment and a knowledge of so many different kinds of lights, right? Yeah, yeah. There's entire trade shows dedicated to just helping lighting designers and lighting professionals keep up to date with what the latest technology is. Um, and if you want to see a little bit of that, that ETC, Electronic Theater Controls website I mentioned before, they create lights as well. So you can definitely see some of it there. Yeah. But if I tried to give a rundown or a sampling of like all of the lighting companies that make equipment, that would be a really long document. Um, <laughs> but if you're interested in learning more, you can absolutely just go Google or search uh, lighting equipment, lighting fixtures, moving lights, any of that. And you can really start to see there's a huge amount of breadth and actually mm. YouTube is a really cool place to go. People make entire shows that are just kind of moving lights, making light shows on their own, which that's, is kind of fun. That's super awesome. And it kind of, that reminds me exactly of what we're gonna do next, right? Yeah, exactly. So we're gonna do another little activity um, where you can start to think about how you can make something using light as your medium. Mm -hmm. um, we're gonna do that via making some shadow puppets. Love it. Uh, so for anyone who had the opportunity to see Tale of Despero last year at the Globe, yeah. uh, which oh, was a great show, show really yeah. big fan, um, they use shadow puppets a lot, actually, to help tell their story. And I think they're kind of a really cool and fun way to get to play with light as a way to do something. Mm -hmm. um, so I made my own shadow puppet, which we're going to look at here. Um, oh. Yeah, so something I really like to do uh, is go, especially when I was living in Utah, Utah is famous for having these national parks that have basically, uh, they're famed for how dark the sky gets, which mm -hmm. is how clearly you can see the stars. Yeah. So I used to go there all the time at night just to go look at the stars. I'd take my dog with me and we'd just go sit and look. Um, and so I decided to make a shadow puppet that reflected that. So I did that in a couple of different ways. I used a flashlight um, and I used some paper to make some little puppets. So here's like my little person oh. on the hill. Um, and for the stars, you can see here, I just took a piece of paper and punched some holes out of it to make stars. Awesome. And what these are both really similar to is something we actually use in lighting design, mm -hmm. uh, which is called a gobo. Oh, it's a gobo. So a gobo is a really thin, usually circular piece of metal that is going to have an image stamped out of it that you can then put in front of a light. Um, so we use it for things like that window I was talking about yeah. that might be in your show. That allows you to kind of project the image of a window through your light. Yeah. Um, if you've ever like hiked at night and you see like kind of the effect of the way light filters through trees, yeah. we can get a gobo that kind of looks like that. And then mm. you can kind of use that as a tool. Yeah. Um, so this is actually very similar to Gobo's is doing, putting something in front of a light and using that to project, project an image. So it's very similar to how a lighting designer works okay, in that so way. This would be the opportunity for folks at home if you want to grab that piece of paper and fold or tear yeah. or cut it into making your own shadow puppet. Um, whatever you make, take a picture and share it with us if you'd like. We'd love to see what you come up with. I will not be uh, cutting paper right now for oh. the sake of time, but I will, I do have, I have a light, I have hands, and I have this funny um, impromptu, what is this called? What would this be called? A backdrop, a screen, a Oh, yeah, painter. look at you. Yeah, otherwise known as a poster board. <laughs> but uh, I'll turn off my lights here so we can see what yeah, we think can make. I think you made a really good point that you don't need anything necessarily kind of the same way you just needed a face and a source of light. You know, people who are a lot more dexterous than me can make faces and animals and everything else. I could only ever really do the bunny ears. Um, but using that as a way to kind of make something with light is really fun. That's so fun. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, you're actually really good at it. I am I'm not. That's why I stuck with the paper. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I've, I've been training for a very long time for this moment. <laughs> Is there what kind of prompt, if I, if I wanted to stretch my imagination in terms of telling a story with light and shadow, what kind of prompt could I think of to tell a story I right think, now? I think kind of like what I did. So I picked something that I really love to do that I thought I could sh tell a story about with light. So I think if you could show us something about something you really enjoy, mm. that'd be kind of fun. Okay. Um, 
something something that I love to do that I, I've really missed since we've all been indoors is swimming. So mm. let me, let's see. Uh, swimming, swimming. Oh, my hands keep getting in it. <laughs> uh, well, it's interesting, right? Because your hands will change size depending on how close or far you are from your light source. Yeah, yeah see, much smaller and then much bigger. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I guess uh, <laughs> something. Yeah, like there you go. It's swimming, you know, getting a little, little swim action in. Just can't do it now. Yay. All right. Yay. <laughs> Thank you, Heather. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, give me a minute to get my, my regular lights back on. <laughs> yeah, so I think something that this can really show us about lighting design, we're not necessarily making shadow puppets, though sometimes we are, as we talked about in the case of Tale of Despero. Yeah. Um, but thinking about, like, where I put an object in relationship to the thing that's lighting it can mm -hmm. really change the composition or the shadow and the way that interacts with what's going on on stage, which is often a decision lighting designers have to, to make. Like if I choose a light that's right here next to a person, that's gonna look really different than if I light them with that light oh. 50 feet away over there. Yeah, That's gonna look really different. Um, so it's definitely like the kind of decisions lighting designers are making are things you are gonna have to choose if you choose to, to do this. And also thinking about light as a medium is really kind of interesting. Yeah. Cause like, how does light actually work can kind of be an interesting problem to solve. Yeah. It's like it's, what happens depending on where I put something in relationship to a light. Right. There's, there's, I've heard you mention before that there's math involved in lighting, right? There is after an entire school career of complaining about having to learn math, I ended up going into a field where we deal with things like angles to determine the size of light we want to use to light something. Yeah. Um, lots of triangles are involved, you know, all of those things. I actually deal with a lot now. So, you know, there's kind of an interesting technical, I don't want to say scientific necessarily, but those kind of things definitely come into play with lighting design in an interesting way. Well, maybe maybe our, our trigonometry April Fool's joke wasn't a joke after all, hey. you know. Maybe this is trigonometry <laughs> 101. <laughs> um, if, if you're at home and if you do make some fun, cool shadow puppets and experiment with angles or distance or color or anything, again, take pictures of those, put them in the comment section. We'd love to see what you come up with. Definitely. Um, so we have we have some questions, so we're going to, we'll, but we have one more quick question, Heather, before we go into those. How did you get involved sure. in lighting? And what, what draws um, you to it that's unique about it? Man, I actually got into lighting kind of by accident, which is kind of funny. Um, when I went to college, I knew I wanted to study theater, mm -hmm. uh, but I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. I thought I might want to be a stage manager. I thought I might want to direct or write, like I kind of gravitated towards those things. Mm -hmm. um, but I was sitting in one of my first classes. It was an intro to design class that everyone had to take. Um, and one of the TAs was a lighting design graduate student who at the end of the class was like, hey, you know, if you're interested, we are just looking for people to help us in the light shop. Um, no experience necessary. Just come let me know if you're at all interested. Uh, and I was sitting there and I was like, you know, I don't really know anything about lighting. And up to that point, I had never really even thought about lighting as like literally an option. It had never really entered my mind at all. Wow. Um, and I was like, well, you know, I don't really know anything about it, but I just want to get involved and like make cool theater. So I'm just going to go, I'll do it. And then I, you know, 10 years later here, we still are. So um, it's kind of funny how things work out like that sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm glad. You're a great yeah, lighting I'm designer. Glad too. So that, oh, that really oh, thank worked you. out. <laughs> yeah. Um, but as for what appeals about it to me, I think a lot of it for me, I was always kind of interested in technology growing mm -hmm. up, like I was kind of the tech support around my parents' house, for lack of a better word, and was always interested kind of in computers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I also really liked the arts and kind of like talking about plays and thinking about art and all of those yeah. things. So like yeah. when I found out about lighting and discovered like it's something where you kind of get to take those two things and, and put them together in a really interesting way. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that. And as much as the hot seat in tech where like you have to make all of those decisions, really quickly is mm -hmm. kind of scary it's also really cool like there's a really once you get into a rhythm it's a there's just nothing like it it's really cool so those are kind of the things that appeal to me about it 
Well, thank you so much for sharing your passion and your knowledge about everything. Yeah. Um, and we have a couple of questions that I want to want to pose to you. So the first one that we got in the comments is, what do you do in case of a light failure during a performance? A number of years ago, such a situation occurred at the Globe, somebody said. Oh, goodness. <gasps> Heather, what happened? What do you do? Oh, well, I mean, it depends on the situation. If it's just one light, a lot of times you can compensate for that. Mm -hmm. um, there might be plans. You might realize that actually if that one light goes out, that's okay. Um, we can turn on this other light or we can try to send someone up to fix it during an intermission or something. Mm. But I actually have also had an entire lighting system fail on me mid-performance before. Oh, um, yeah, so fun story. I was at the Utah Shakespeare Festival. I was working as the light board operator and also as a lighting programmer. Um, and I was in the middle of a performance of Twelfth Night. Mm -hmm. And I was like looking at something on the light board or was doing something else. And because we were almost to the end of the act and I was like, oh, this will be fine. And so in the middle of the final scene of act one of Twelfth Night, all the lights just uh, went out all of a sudden for no apparent reason. Oof. And the stage manager literally like grabbed me by the shoulder and was like, hey, that's clearly wrong. Oof. And I look up and there's just no light on stage at all. There's just nothing. And it turns out the um, lighting comes with a lot of networking now to, on the technical side. Mm -hmm. uh, the network switch that helps send all of the information out had completely failed in the middle of the performance. Just the physical button. Yeah, the physical box wow. had failed in the middle of the performance. Oh no. Um, so of course that leads to me, the sound technician who was there was actually helped me a lot and like trying to run around, called my boss who was the lighting director there and was like, uh, all the lights are off, I don't know what to do. Um, and you just, you problem solve really quick and you make those decisions really quick. Um, what we ended up doing was being able to bypass that one box. Mm. But I think the thing about it is there's not really any one answer. It's just the way a whole team will come together, right? Mm. So me and the sound technician and yeah. everyone else are running around trying to figure out as quickly as possible how to solve this problem. And we're really helped by the members of the cast who went on stage and helped entertain the audience, literally using hand lanterns so that the audience wow. could see them we'd managed to get the audience lights back on which was wow. great so those wow. were on but they were just using hand lanterns and flashlights and like telling stories and just keeping the audience entertained and those all of those things are really helpful to the team of people who are scrambling to try to get whatever is happening working so yeah you know there's not really any set way to fix those problems it's just a matter of you having to trust in your knowledge and ability and working through these things while yeah. relying on the rest of the team that's there with you to help you kind of make the audience experiment as, experience as enjoyable as possible despite a delay and technical difficulty. That sounds like a nightmare that I'm very glad went so well <laughs> in the end. Um, yeah, it wasn't fun in the moment, but now it's kind of a fun story. Right, right, not in the moment. <laughs> yeah. Our, uh, our next question is, does using a green gel on one light give a different look from using a yellow gel on one light and a blue gel on another? Ooh, so if one light mm. has a green gel on it, is that gonna look exactly the same as if I have two other lights, one red, one blue, with those beams uh, together? So a couple different things will happen. Green in particular does really interesting things to skin tone. Mm. Um, so that will react with people in an interesting mm. way. And once you start getting like, if it's one light on on its own, then ultimately, yes, a single green light and a single blue light and a single red light, we may feel differently about them because mm. they're different colors, mm. but ultimately the lights themselves are gonna look pretty similar. Mm -hmm. If I start mixing them together, that's when things kind of start getting interesting, right? Mm -hmm. There's a couple of different things will happen. Where the color is overlapping, you're going to have like a weird kind of mixed color of those things. Mm -hmm. But let's say I have a green light coming from this way and a red light coming from this way. Right. If I hold my hand up like this, light's not going to get through my hand. Yeah. So I'm going to have a really interesting effect where I have one color here and one color hmm. here. Oh, so Physically, yes, ultimately the lights are going to look the same with just a difference in color. Um, but once you start combining them, you can get into some really interesting things with color. Cool. Okay, so we have two more questions. One, Heather, are the lights moved via a remote control or does a person have to move from light to light and back again to change the direction they are pointing? Ah, actually both of those things can be true. So there are types of lights 
where a physical person has to go and change the focus of it and move it and all of those things. And then there's also going to be moving lights, which we talked about a little bit before, where it's going to be a motorized light that is able to change its focus and angle and all of those things and can be remotely controlled by someone at the light board. Mm -hmm. um, who is doing all of that. So both of those things are true. Now, ultimately, the light that does move, at some point, some person had to go there and put it wherever it is. Yeah. But yes, actually, both of those things are true. So at focus, generally, what you're going to be focusing on, for lack yeah. of a better term, yeah. is those lights where a physical person has to go and point them, because that is dedicated time for you to do that. Whereas those moving lights, you're going to be making decisions about where to focus them all of the time during the tech process. Okay, nice. I'm learning so much. I feel like I'm learning the most. In this I'm, moment. I'm glad. Um, last, last, almost last question. Any tips for breaking into a professional design career? Oh, um, well, my first tip is it's never going to happen if you don't try. So you have to be willing to try first and know that it's not going to be easy all the time and it's not going to be fun all the time. I think that's the first thing to keep in mind. Mm. Uh, the second thing is don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, there is no shame in saying, I don't know. I say that not all the time, but a decent amount of time at the Globe because of all that technology we talked about before, yeah. you absolutely yeah. can't be afraid to say, I actually don't know how to do that. Mm. Um, or I don't know how I'm going to do that. And that's when you turn to colleagues, mm. you turn to friends, mm. all of those things are, are really important. Um, and I think kind of related to the first one is just, if you want to try it, go out there and try it, you know, go offer to hang lights. You know, the globe, we've had yeah. people email us before students who are interested and ask if they can come sit in on tech and just get the chance to talk to the lighting designer and observe what it is that they're doing during tech. We're so happy to do that. What I've found in my career is that the people that I work with, especially designers, but ultimately all of the people I work with are really generous with their time actually. And if you show a genuine interest and are willing to put in the work to try to talk to them, if mm -hmm. they have time, a lot of them are really willing to do that. Um, so those are all ways to break in. As for actually breaking in, honestly, you could go talk to 15 lighting designers about how their career got started, and they'll probably have 15 different stories for you. <laughs> well, yours began um, so with there's not really yes. a clear, a clear path, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, I love that about um, not being afraid to start uh, thinking back to the the day when you decided to just help hang lights and, and then yeah, and it, you know, life. it turned out it turned out really, really well for me. Yeah, <laughs> turned out. But great. if I hadn't been unafraid to go and say I know literally nothing about yeah. this, you'll have to tell me everything. Yeah. I never would have gotten started. Well, here's a question that I don't know anything about. Somebody commented, "Okay, Heather Lee oh, or boy. Roscoe." Oh, what does that mean? <laughs> so Lee. <laughs> This is a lighting person asking this question. Okay. So Lee and Roscoe are manufacturers mostly of gel, mm -hmm. gel being that different, those different colors right, right. that we have. Um, so there's kind of three main manufacturers. There's Roscoe, there's GAM, who is actually owned by Roscoe now, but I believe they've maintained a separate product line still under the GAM name. And then there's Lee, which is a UK based company that also makes gel. And those are kind of the three major gel manufacturers. Mm -hmm. So those are the colors you're really choosing from as a lighting designer. Oh. So what this person is asking me is whose colors do I like more? And I would have to say, honestly, it's a little bit of gam because I really like their blues, but also I like Roscoe. I don't use a ton, a ton of Lee. Lee 201 I use like every lighting designer ever, but um, I'd probably lean on the Roscoe gam side of that. Well, thank you for explaining. And there you have it. Uh, and I, this is we're gonna we're gonna close up now. So I just want to say, Heather, thank you so so much for Absolutely. being the pilot episode, our first guest artist. This has been Ooh. amazing, and thank you for being such a wonderful teacher. And and before <laughs> before you leave, do you want to do one quick one word checkout about how we sure. feel in this moment? All right, go ahead. I'm feeling uh, really positive and still energized. I think. Woo. I'm feeling grateful. Super, super grateful to you, Heather. Thank you so Thank much. You. Um, and we're, I, look, I look forward to seeing you around next time I get to see you. Who knows when that may be? Yeah, the, exactly. Moments, we'll we'll really all nice. find out together. Yes. Thank you so much again. Thank you. We'll see you, we'll see you yep. some other time. And, um, and for you, I'm also grateful to you watching at home. Arts engagement programs don't make any sense if, there's, if they're not part of a community. So if you've been watching, 
like it or not, you're officially part of our community. So welcome to the Arts Engagement family. And if you enjoyed this workshop, and if you'd like to support free, accessible online theater programming like this during a challenging time in San Diego, arts organizations around the world are fighting to keep serving their communities and come out on the other side of this global crisis. So you can be a part of innovating the arts as a public service during this time. And all you got to do is go to theoldglobe.org and make any donation uh, that, you would, that you'd like to contribute to this moment. So thank you again so much for joining us. And I'll see you here for our next workshop. But don't forget, tomorrow, 3 p.m., Community Voices Playwriting Class with the amazing Katie Haroff right here on the Old Globe Arts Engagement Facebook page. Thank you again so much for joining. See you next time.